Good morning, everyone. My guest today is Twisagi Jackson Kagori, and with his book, The Price of Stones, in the hardback. And the same book has been released by Penguin, but with a different title, A School for My Village. Good morning, Jackson. Let's start with the titles. What is the difference of titles between the hardback and the paperback? The titles, <coughs> we had The Price of Stones as the hardcover title, which we thought described how the schools were built. People who didn't have stones and bricks donated bricks and stones to build this. But it also had a Christian connotation, the biblical view of a stone that was rejected by builders became a cornerstone. Uh, when we came to paperback, we started with the penguin marketing people and they all looked and said, Any, everybody who you know who has donated to Nyaka, that cycle of people have all read the hardcover. Yeah. And Nyaka, what is Nyaka exactly? Nyaka is the village where the school, one school is located. It's the short for Nyaka Jersey, which means land of the hills. So the second one was changed to capture the imagination of anybody who might not already know about our work, but walking through the aisles will still say, that book, I want to capture it. Very uh, rarely do I come across books I really truly find inspiring. Was it your idea to write the biography? I didn't grow up going, oh, I want to write a book one day and tell my story. Uh, I'm not a writer. I, was no, I didn't go to school to write. But once I started the schools and children started coming through school, I realized that each time I went back home, the children who were in our school looked at Jackson as if God just dropped me from heaven to come and save their lives. Mm -hmm. So I wanted the children to see me as a child at their age. So what I had done over the years, I was writing stories, one story at a time for them, print it on the computer and send it to the teachers so they can see. Jackson is falling out of a tree. Jackson disobeyed his dad and went swimming from church. Jackson is not listening to his sister and now sees in a hospital. Mm -hmm. Jackson is getting in trouble. I wanted them to see me as a child, but I also wanted them to know if I could beat odds in that village and become a person I have become, they can also do it. So I had written like 52 stories, short stories, beginning and end. So as I continued fundraising, people who read these said, you know what, Jackson, this could be a book. Uh, that's when I teamed up with Susan Linvier to look at these stories, put them together, select a few of them, which ended up being a book. Maybe you want to tell the audience listening to us about the Nyaka School and what got you started to build it. How did you step into that? My parents, just like many other parents in that village, were determined to see us break the cycle of poverty and deprivation. And to do that, you have to get an education. But as we graduated and I finished university in Uganda, I was admitted at Columbia University in the program of Human Rights Advocates Program. I'm here in New York City. That's when my brother was back home in Uganda dying of HIV AIDS. So he died of HIV AIDS. My sister died of HIV AIDS. They both left children who were orphaned now and would have dropped out of school, went living with my parents if I didn't have a job to support them. So I took up my nieces and nephews and started helping them to stay in school, to get uniforms, to get pencils. But each time I would take my nieces and nephews from the capital city in Uganda to the village where my parents live, there was always thousands of other children whose parents had also passed away, mainly because of HIV and AIDS, but who did not have an uncle to keep them in school, to buy them a pencil, to buy them a pen. And with my nieces and nephews, I would line them up and we would start giving pencils and pens and uniform and a book so these children would stay in school. But there was also a line of grandmothers who lived with these children. And that's when we said with my wife, that instead of passing pencils and pens, let's put on a small school and help as many children as we can. 
that's how the whole idea started. You've changed my view of pennies. I walk in the street of New York, I always see pennies on pavements. I never used to pick them up. Now I always do, and people think I'm completely insane. But I put them in a jar and then I give them to your organization or some others. Good job. But job. Um, tell us the importance of the penny in relation to the pencil. I carry a pencil with me everywhere I go. Right here. In Uganda, education is paid for. And if you show up at school without a pencil, the teacher will send you home. And if your parents don't have a chicken sell that day to buy you a pencil, your dream for education ends right there. What my dad would do, he would go and buy one pencil, two cents. I think in 1970s, it was even less, like half a cent. And he would cut that pencil five times for all five children one by one line us up and give us this fifth of the pencil. And for me, with everything I've accomplished in my life up to date, all revolved on a fifth of the pencil. We could talk a little bit about the importance of the grandmother, because obviously AIDS has created a sort of a generation hall where there's kids and, and grandmother and there's nothing in, pretty much in between. So how, how important they are to the stability of the school. I write a whole chapter about grandmothers in that book. When we looked at the children who are coming to our schools, the children who are suffering and the ones who are coming to get a pencil from me, many they came with grandmothers. Many grandfathers have died. The grandmothers are left behind by themselves. So we started a program where we now support 7,000 grandmothers who live with 34,500 children all over two districts, which would be two counties, provide them training in parenting. They parented their own children. That was a different generation. This is a different generation. Give them microfinance loans as low as $25 to buy chickens so they can have something, eggs, to plant cabbages and tomatoes, to do baskets so they can have an income. And so we invest in them, and then we got a grant a year ago where we went in and built houses for these grandmothers. 135 houses we finished with a tin roof. For the first time, a woman now lives in a house that is not going to leak when it rains. That is huge. Uh, so we are now working towards getting the secondary school built. Secondary school, because we've invested already seven years in these children, they are in their teen years, 13, 14, 15, and we are sending them in a boarding school outside the village far away. And we are going to invest in these children until they have a certificate, a diploma, a degree in their hands, and then we'll tell them now go find a job. Oh, here is a job we will connect you with, whether it is film making, music, singing, whatever it is, now you can also take on and support another community. We want them at prior effect. We want to see them give back. They're already giving back in their own small ways, and we want them to give back so the whole organization be sustainable and we can reach more villages. Next, we are initiating a brand new segment called The Pick of the Week, where we select a book that we especially love. This week we've selected a first novel from a writer from Minneapolis called Kate Ledger, and she has written the first fantastic novel called Remedy. It's a story of uh, Simon, a doctor, who comes across or stumbles upon a uh, drug that I think is going to revolutionize the world. And of course, as uh, because he's a rational being, he's pretty much blind to the suffering going around him, especially with his wife and daughter, and that creates his own problems. So um, if you're looking for a great read for the summer, I would strongly advise to, to read uh, Kate Ledger's uh, Remedies. It's a uh, big fun book. <laughs>